The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies, Gig Nation Tours, and the generous donations of you, the listener. Thank you to everyone for your continued support. We really appreciate it. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast, episode 223. Sword and Spear Fantasy. With hosts, Neil Shook, Mike Hobbs, and Mike Whitaker, and guest, Mark Lewis. Nazi megastructures. The, the mm. one this week was all on um, Italy. All on oh, the. Was it? Um, I shall clearly have to go back and and watch it. Yeah, it'll it'll be on catch up. But it was all about the Gothic defense line. lines. Yeah, yeah. Gothic, that's just that's my bag, man. That is my bag. Yeah, it was really really interesting. They they showed this little village on. I don't think it was on the Gothic line. It was on one of the the second. What, what was the first major line that they had down oh, yeah. down south? I can't remember what it's called, but they they basically reinforced this little hilltop village, and it, it's still there. And yeah. fab. Yeah, really, really interesting stuff. What was that what? program again? Nazi, Nazi mega structures. Nazi structures. Oh yeah. Structures. It's actually a really good series. It's not on Channel Five, is it? <laughs> no, it's um, um, so so. Pain, pain size from all around. No, dear boy, no. Yeah, okay. No, it's it's sort of, with a name like Nazi Megastructures. It just yeah. sounds like it's going to be one of those sort of shows. Yeah, you you think that? No, it it it's actually pretty good. They got um Tom Holland's on there. Oh, okay, yeah. And um Tony Pollard, and so they got some quite well respected historians on there, and, and sort of battlefield archaeologists and stuff. So uh, it's it's well worth um, picking up. Or having a look at. Definitely. Mm. Cool. Well, hello, gentle listeners. You join us in in, in the middle of conversation. Uh, As always. <laughs> indeed. Welcome to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. Uh, my name is Neil Shook. Uh, you have also heard the dulcet tones of uh, our very own w- Welsh wizard. Hello, Meeps. Hello, Mr. Hobbs. Are you well? I'm very well. And how are you, Neil? How are the listeners? Are the listeners well? Um, uh, we'll come back to them in a second. Uh, okay. But first, let us let us introduce our, our, yeah, our travelling troubadour, and pray tell Mr. Whitaker. What culinary delights do you have for us this week? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not quite sure what category it falls into. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's a little Dutch thing called a stroopwafel. What? Stroop waffle. Okay. It's basically sort of a, a, a caramelly wafer thing that's fractionally larger than the size of your teacup. So you can stand it, stick it on top of your oh, teacup. Oh, yes, it's one of those. Yes, 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 yes. Which are jolly nice. Yes, they are. Yes, they indeed. They are jolly nice. Yes. Sold in, sold in several um, well known coffee now. shops. They used to be really hard. I used to have to persuade Dutch friends to bring them back for me. Yeah, you can now buy mini ones as well, can't you? And stuff like oh, that. they're yes. no fun, because half of half the art is you place it on top of your nice hot cup of tea so the camera at Caravan goes all nice and melty and then take it off before it falls in. In tea? As always, folks, um, the recipe for the chicken that Mike is eating will be on the Meeple. No, they won't, because anybody worth their salt can walk into Sainsbury's and buy them these days. Jeez, jeez, obviously, <laughs> get with a <the> programme. <laughs> We're trying to promote the, the cookery side of the podcast, Mike. I'm trying to promote, promote the cake side of the podcast. Cookery is optional. <laughs> oh, dear. It's a different opinion. We're going to have to go our separate ways, I'm afraid. Well, uh, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, especially since you know, here we are, where where Mr. Hobbs gave valuable painting time to actually 
cook food instead. I mean, oh. But he did according to your Twitter feed anyway. You know? I did, yes. Yes. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Mr. Hobbs asked how our, ge- how our gentle listeners were. I received an email uh, from a listener who I-, I will only name as John. Hello, John. You know who you are. And all I can say at this point is that John obviously had a little bit too much time on his hands recently. Oh, dear God. Uh, he came back and, and uh, has actually challenged myself and, and the great guru himself, who I noticed is, is, is noticeable by his absence. So he's obviously run away from this. He's asking uh, and indeed demanding an answer to the question, why on earth do board games don't count when it comes to, when it comes to dilution theory? I don't think we ever said that board games never counted in dilution theory. They just never counted towards buying miniatures games. And and he, and he says, well, yeah, I, I don't wish to be pedantic, but you know, surely you know, you the more board games you buy, the more they dilute the pool of what you have. I'll tell you exactly why they don't count towards dilution theory. What's that then? Because dilution theory is fundamentally flawed, and it's Luffy's cop out. Yes. However, yeah. however. You say that, and then our dear listener John goes on and says, so he went. He goes back, starting around episode 150, and put, puts together what he considers to be my current undiluted game collection. What, well, yours? Yes. Man, you're so screwed. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, suffice it to say, the email then goes on for several pages. Which is tricky with an email. <laughs> Thanks for that, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think you deserve a reward, John, just for going through the last hundred and how many <laughs> Indeed. podcasts. Indeed. Uh, yes, uh, as we say, Obviously, a dedicated listener with far too much time on his hands. Uh, but thank you for that. I, uh, yes, I do appreciate that list of that list of projects that uh, I have listed as being um, my uh, major and uh, m- my major and minor <coughs> product. In fact, there's there's a couple here I completely forgot about. Good grief, Thud Ridge! Crikey, up, oh, crikey, that well, that's right. Back at the beginning, I was talking about Thud Ridge. I still I think um, work of this caliber. I mean, this is this is truly, um, you know, this is proper academic work. This is proper research. This needs to be published. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. For for peer v- review, I I I think we should insist. And um, and if you don't, John, send me the email, and I'll make sure it gets published. All I say is, yeah, thanks, John, and uh, yeah, love you too, mate. <laughs> Good work, John. You can class yourself as the Meeple's chief ar- archivist. Indeed. I was don't... going to trouble cause it. <laughs> see, <laughs> don't do me don't do me and Mike next, okay? Do do um do Luffy. So I'm just looking down to I'm just looking down to really I was like, Yes, I talked about that. Yes, I talked about that. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. I I I am in so much trouble. Moving swiftly on. Thank you, John. Uh, right, okay, so what are we gonna talk about? On today's show, well, this is a show that originally was going to come out last week, uh, but we got distracted with uh, Troll Trader, and uh, I think the less we say about about what may have happened after that, after the end of that particular recording session, the better. Uh, yes, move along, nothing else to see here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, and so this week, uh, we are talking with uh, Mark Lewis... Uh, who you may remember, uh, if that name rings a bell, he is the author of uh, Sword and Spear. Uh, but we are talking to him this time about his fantasy rules, uh, Sword and Spear fantasy, which were released at Salute, and uh, we finally uh, had a chance to catch up with him, and so we're going to find out all about it, and Mr. Hobbs can finally wax lyrical, having been silent for... A number of months since he was involved in uh, playtesting the game. And so we can get, hopefully get him to divulge a couple of little bits and pieces. Maybe. 
Yes, yes, indeed. I can, I, I can talk about things I did. Those of us who have very kindly backed us on, uh, uh, donated to us uh, uh, on Patreon and uh, PayPal may now have heard uh, our last Inside the Bunker in which Mr. Hobbs divulges uh, the, the secret life of playtesting. Yes. This is almost a follow-up episode. But before we do that, <laughs> before we do that, obviously, it's time to catch up with what we've been up to for the last week. So we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll catch up with uh, what we've been playing, what we've been buying, and you never know. Yeah, we may have painted something. I don't like it, Sergeant. Me neither, sir. Good Lord, it's really looking pretty bad. Yes, sir. It happens every time, sir. It's too predictable, sir. How far do you think we've uh, we've advanced, Sergeant? Six inches, sir. It's always six inches. We advance six inches, then Jerry gets a go. The lads are, uh, are calling it Hygo Hugo, sir. Hygo Hugo? Really? And they don't like it, sir. Oh. Oh, not like it. Ah, uh, well, uh, seems pretty straightforward to me. Rather like cricket. We have an innings, then uh, the other chap does. Well, that's all very well, sir. Cricket, sir. But begging your pardon. It ain't like that, sir, in war. I don't think Mr. Hitler plays like that. What, Hitler? No, gosh, he would like to go all the time. Oh, no, sir, lovey. Oh. Well, well, sir, anyway, sir, it's like this, sir. If it carries on like this, hi go, you go. Me and the lads won't be coming to your Thursday evening games club, and that's the way it is, sir. Looking for more of a challenge with your World War II games? Are you tired of the predictability of I go, you go systems? Iron Bean Shop Mum provides real command challenges on an unpredictable battlefield. Two fat lardies, playing the period and not the rules since 2002. Pip pip! What have we been playing? What have we been buying? We might even have painted something. The Meeples and Miniatures crew reveal all. Welcome back, dear gentle listener, to our discussion on what we've been up to. I can go first because I haven't done anything. That'll be easy then. Are you sure? Yeah, not very little. No painting at all, because uh, of things that are happening. I have been playing games. Ask me if I can talk about them, Neil. Mr. Hobbs, you've been playing games. Interesting. What have you been playing? What can you tell us? Can't talk about it, Neil. Can't talk about it at all. But I've been playing games. Okay, and if you want any further reference to that, please see episode 6 of Inside the Bunker, available on our Patreon feed. Yes. <laughs> I have been buying a few things. A few? Uh, actually, just one thing this week. Mm-hmm. Right. Need to do a little shout out to a different podcast. So, I discovered a, a podcast called the Grod- Grognad Files, which is run by Grognard. Dirk- yes. Grognard. No, Grognad Files. Run by Dirk the Dice. And it's a podcast all about role playing games that came out in the 80s. Right. Oh, it's good. Oh, it is really good. I've listened to the RuneQuest ones and Stormbringer and Traveller. Uh, they also cover Tunnels and Trolls. Oh, dear. Um, AD&D. From the Going 80s, you say? From the 80s, yeah. Oh, dear. Um, I think I need to steer oh. clear of this podcast. <laughs> you and me it's, both. It is a fantastic... It's been going a couple of years. Fantastic podcast, Re- really good. The guy has got a great sense of humour, knows his stuff. Um, yeah, I've been listening to that. And because of that, I bought um, the Hawkman role-playing game, which came out in the mid-80s. 
which completely passed me by because I wasn't gaming at that, that stage. It's a game that was produced by KSM. It's it's based on the the sort of basic uh, role playing system, which is sort of based on RuneQuest Second Edition. It looks very good, standalone game. So I I got I tracked down a copy on eBay, and that's that's winging its way to me even as we speak. Ooh. I have to say, I always had a very soft spot, and I think we discussed this in um, the skirmish Sangin interview on the actual core mechanics of RuneQuest. Mm. The the attack versus defense roll, the percentage skill checks, the get a skill tick and roll under your skill to to improve it, kind yeah. of thing. Um, oh, sorry, what was the difference between whatever it was? There was the difference between your skill and a hundred to improve it, so it's hard to improve the further up you are. Yeah. I just never liked the battle magic system; it just the world didn't feel right to me. Yeah, well, they they took. I mean, obviously, it was based on um, Lanfa, which is a you know, it, if you're into that sort of. Um, sort of background is really interesting. And I, I, I was really into it. I, I loved the whole background of it. And I, I, I did like how magic worked because magic was open to, to everybody. But I, I can see what you're saying, Mike, because it is... I, uh, I think at, It's at a bit of a mar isn't it? The point that when, when I was exposed, as if you were to RuneQuest, I was very much of the a wizard is a wizard and a fighter is a fighter skill to thought. So mm. it didn't quite feel right. But hey, but uh, yeah, so they, they they took that base sort of mechanics from there, and they, they did quite a few games. Because so they, they did, I think, Call of Cthulhu was based on the same system, uh, Stormbringer, and and Hawkmoon was sort of uh, uh, an offshoot of Stormbringer. Uh, but it just looked great in standalone game, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have that because I've got some Hawkmoon figures. Really? <laughs> you yeah. have mentioned that in the past, I think. You, you surprise yeah. me, yes, because. Uh, yeah, Yes, because uh, a certain company are yes, hello, hello everyone at Eureka uh, are in the process of producing some officially licensed Talkman figures. Very nice as well. Yeah, they're very nice. Yeah, they're, they're going to be going on my painting trade soon. Ooh. Um, that's about it. Oh, one other major piece of news for me. Go on then. Um, I've been followed on Twitter by Pat Mills. And this is where you two go, who's Pat Mills? <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah, I did. I was going to say, yes, of which somebody once said, who? <laughs> Pat Mills. Right, Pat Mills was the editor and the creator of Battle Magazine, a Battle Picture Weekly. He was the author of Charlie's War, which is one of the greatest World War I comic strips ever produced. And then he was... Um, the, the main editor and creator of a little thing called 2000 AD. Oh, oh that, that Pat Mills. That, that Pat Mills, yes. <laughs> him. Oh, well, what's the phrase? No pressure then, Mr. Hobbs. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to um, up my Twitter game. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was fun. Funny, uh, apparently he's got a, um, a uh, spoken words um, book just come out, all about the secrets of 2000 AD. Ooh, fun. Mmm. That may have to be bought. Mm. <laughs> It'll audio book. So, there we go. That, that's me. That's you. I haven't done much, but I'm very excited. It's Pat Mills. Not pledged for any Kickstarters or anything, man? No, no, I've been good. Mm. Uh, how about you, Mr. Whitaker? Oh, not an awful lot. I had a, a fun and interesting game of being shot one down the club on Monday, which you might have seen a couple of photos for on Twitter. Basically gave the Germans a, a ruined church and a villa in a in a pass through uh, through a valley to hold um, with one section a machine gun platoon a pack forty and a Panzer four and watch the British bounce a company off them with great pain. It was quite fun actually. <laughs> clearly, clearly a well dug in German platoon with machine gun support is a really tough nut to crack. Hmm. Because they're all in hardcover. They're all you, you. They're going to spot you before they you spot them, and they, you know when their blinds come off, cards comes up. They reserve actions. As soon as something appears in the field field of fire, they use the reserved actions to come off blinds and shoot at you, which typically means that the two that two of the three Shermans that appeared under the nose of the pack fourteen got shot. Um, yep. It was fun though, um, and and no, another nice demonstration of why I like I am being shot, mum. And I've been doing a little research into Operation White Hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought you'd say that, which I knew nothing about until I was looking at 
Churchill's for the um, Italy campaign on the grounds that once we've re- once we've had the second th- second battle on the right flank of the campaign, the British will be going back to that valley with some more armoured support, which is going to be some Churchill's. And I was looking through to see what particular sub-model of Churchill from the seven or eight the Plastic Soldier Company kit will let you build. You were supposed uh, that was common. And I came across the Churchill NA-75, which I hadn't heard about before. <laughs> this is quite a nice little story. Basically, there's, in Tunisia, there was a, a certain observation that the uh, Churchill that they were issued with was undergunned because the six-pounder had a fairly short range and was absolutely useless at firing HE, which made the Churchill, which is an infantry tank, not terribly handy as an infantry support vehicle. Hmm. So, um, a chap by the name of Major Percy Morrill, oh, sorry, Captain Percy Morrill, as he was at the time, was apparently having a bit of a think. And, and they were in the process of scrapping a bunch of Sherman Falls, or various, various Shermans that had been variously shot up or hit in a minefield. And, the, and quotes, very often the least damaged part of the scrap tanks was the main armament, which is a 75. Now that's, that's, no worse an anti-tank weapon than the six-pounder with better range, and far as the hell of a sight, better HE. Hmm. And he's he's a Royal Engineer, so he basically dug out a whole bunch of plots and plans and satisfied himself that you could actually get a Sherman 75 inside a Churchill turret, <laughs> wrote a letter to his CO, <laughs> didn't get round to sending it, and his CO actually found it on the table in the office when he dropped in a couple of days later, just called him in, grilled him about it, and basically said, okay, um, here, here it goes. If you make, a, and I quote, if you can make a success of this project, I'll see you don't lose by it. If, on the other hand, you can't make a job of it and you render unserviceable a tank which costs the British taxpayer a great deal of money, you can take it that your career has advanced just about as far as it's going to. <laughs> <laughs> so he disappears off into the labs with a brand new Churchill four, and and the the M three the M three seventy five mil from a down Sherman. And, and spends 10 days and, and about 400 arc welding rods and some devious bits of engineering grafting the, the M4 onto the M3 howitzer, the M3 um, 75 mil onto a German turret, onto Churchill turret, which actually looks really odd because, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with, with the Churchill, the, the six pounder and the, the 75 when it, when it got a proper 75 mount actually mounts in back of the turret faceplate. There's almost a, a, a there's there's a, a cutout in the front of the turret, and the uh, and there's a piece of armor plate the gun's fitted to that moves up and down behind it. Yes. And one of the other drawbacks of this was that it produced a nice little shadow, which ger- ger- German German gun aim, tank anti tank gunners used to take as an aiming point, which was not good if you were inside the Churchill. So this is literally it's a Churchill with the the Trinian from a from a Sherman mounted on the flattened front of the turret. And the mantle, and the so it looks really does look like a, a weird Sherman Churchill hybrid. Uh, it turns out this is the one model that Plastic Soldier Company don't provide. Wouldn't you just know it? <laughs> Wouldn't you just know it? However, if you take the Mark IV turret from a Ch- Plastic Soldier Ch- um, Company Sherman Churchill, you file the front flat rather than the slightly curved that it is at the moment, then you go into your box of M4A2s which I have loads of for Italy, for which I haven't used the thin mantlet and, and trinian for the 75, you can graph those on the front of a Churchill smartphone turret and make it a Churchill NA75. So I've got three of those on the stocks at the moment. Who says this show isn't educational? Well, it's apparently gets blown up the first time you put it on the table. Oh, almost <laughs> certainly! It's got better armour than the Sherman, though. <laughs> it's got as good a gun as... The, it's got a good as good a gun at the Sherman and two points better armour. So it might survive a bit longer than the three Shermans did on Monday. The only problem I have at the moment is the um, the metal metal pin tube on my um, liquid poly has, has, has gunked up and I can't get any liquid poly out, so I can't actually start the project. If anybody's got any good suggestions for clearing that, I'm all ears. Uh, I've been piece of wire. It happened to me about two weeks ago. Um, I just got a, a... Very thin piece of wire. Yeah, I, I got a bit of old um, electrical... Wire, okay. um, stripped off the, the insulation and poked it through. Yeah, just got one of those and just poked it through. Right, cool. 
I will probably have to do that because I'm sitting here with the necessary pieces to build a, uh, an, an NA75 turret and uh, no way of gluing them together. Or <laughs> failing, or failing that and you want something that maybe it has a, uh, isn't likely to bend as much. Uh, how about a used guitar string? I might have some of those. <laughs> that's what, well, that's what I was thinking, you know. Yeah, well, I'm sure I've broken a toppy recently. <laughs> well, quite. <laughs> Good thought, that man. Mm. Right. So, so, some of them be searching Churchill's. Uh, yeah, anything but, else you anyway, want to anyway, say? No, but yeah, as I said, this, this was apparently known as Operation White Hot. Oh, right, okay. And they, yeah, the, and they converted about 200 of them, working 24 hours around the clock. Mm. I will, I will paste you the link for the show notes because there is a link online to his actual account of what happened. He got promoted to major and awarded an MBE for it. Oh, did it affect the speed of the, of the church? Oh, no, the interesting thing. Apparently, the interesting thing was that um, six pounders load on the right and seventy fives load on the left, which meant they had to uh, basically invert the breach as well. Which, fortunately, I don't have to do with part of the plastic soldier conversion. No. Anyway, there you go. So, yeah, that's me. Um, that's pretty much all I've done this week. We'll be prepping for the other partisan where we're bringing in I Ain't Been Shop. I'm late game. Hmm. Yes, because that's, yes, that's only in a couple of weeks, isn't it? And Heroin is only four weeks away. Hmm. I trust you both coming. What, to Heroin? Hmm. I think so. Oh, I, 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 I might do. Let's see how it goes. Sunday, September the 3rd. Thir- September the 3rd. Same place as last year, same website as last year. Links will no doubt be in the show notes. Indeed, indeed. So well, that's me. That's you. Well, it only leaves me. Hmm. Painting achieved, zero. Games played, a couple. Uh, we had another couple of games of Dungeon Saga. Uh, how's that going? How's that going? Uh, yeah. yeah, we died again. Did you? Twice. Are you uh, using the um the, the pre? No, we're the not. Medium? No, we're not. You see, uh, this is uh, someone has flagged up to us because we've been using our own rolled characters, and somebody has flagged up to us that the uh, that perhaps the the pre generated characters uh, from uh, the original bot game are perhaps slightly stronger and uh, slightly more suited. Uh, and balanced towards the game we were playing. However, at the same time, I think we have kind of twigged a little bit about you know s- some of the tactics we were using were perhaps slightly wrong. Mr. Luffy's getting a little bit frustrated with us because we now failed that five times. <laughs> and it's like, he's just looking at us kind of going, how can the, you possibly fail this five times? It's the first scenario, it's not the easier one. Yeah, it's meant to be the easy one, and yes, we've uh, yes, it's always been a case of, well, you know, lovely tends to kind of kind of just like gang up on somebody, and before you know it, uh, you know, but we have deciphered perhaps what we have done slightly wrong, and we're going to give it another go. Sixth time's a charm. Uh, so that was that was that, and then you, question for you: Are you actually gaining any experience in getting better each time you fail? No. Why not? You should be, shouldn't you? The only thing we're gaining, we, we can... Because you can't gain experience from a failed quest. You can gain... Yeah, you can gain a bit of gold and stuff, which is something we we then went back... Because the other thing is, Mr. Luff is, is, is a bit paranoid. He doesn't want to make us too powerful too soon, so we then can't go into the later dungeons. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, pardon me. <laughs> yes. Why don't you use the money that you, you earn... To hire four mercenaries and use them to go in. <laughs> Maybe like a guy like a dwarf and a barbarian mm. and an elf magic user and. Uh, and maybe a ranger. And a ranger, yeah. 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 Really? Who'd have thunk? Yeah. Yes, that's a really good idea. In fact, I've got this bunch here with. with um, I can even find the names for you if you want to give you good contact details. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know. If only you had some figures to, to, to if represent only. those four. If only. If only, yeah. If only. Yeah. Use the figures in the game, Neil. you find it a lot easier. I shall mention it to the chaps tomorrow night and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see what the response is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, so that was, that's our misadventures. I continuing misadventures in Dungeon Saga. Uh, and then I mentioned last week, uh, in, in my purchasing that uh, I, I purchased by proxy 
and bought Josh uh, Ninja All Stars for his birthday. Well, we managed to get a couple of games of Ninja All Stars in this week. Let me guess, he hates it, and you're going to have to keep it. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Oh, what a great game! Cracking little game. We'll definitely have to do a full review of it, uh, and, and you know, might even get him on for that. But you never know. Uh, but no, it is a cracking little game, it, and it is. You know, it is one of those classic hybrids. Actually, it's a miniature skirmish game on a board. You know, with a little bonus act, your cards you can use for, you know, little bonus buffs and, uh, and various other bits and pieces. And, oh yeah, cracking little game. Cracking little game. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. Ninja All Stars. So, yep. Yeah. that. So, pl- played a couple of games of that. Looking forward to playing a lot more of that stuff. Uh, and again, that's got like its its own included campaign system and various other bits and pieces. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to playing more of that. And then I may have pledged for a Kickstarter that we chatted about last week. May have. Okay, I did. But yeah, you know, that's about it. And then and then another Kickstarter launched a couple of days ago. Uh, which I'm currently looking at and drooling over because uh, I do like the uh, vehicles that Antonosity's Workshop produce. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, there'll also be a link on the blog to this. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, Antonosity's Workshop are producing, are currently running a Kickstarter. Uh, and they are producing a range of vehicles uh, in both 15 and 28 mil. Same range of vehicles, two different sizes, two different scales. They are very, very nice indeed. Uh, so if you like sci-fi vehicles that look a little bit different, uh, including uh, an absolutely amazing dropship, uh, then go and take a look at the current Antonosity's Workshop Kickstarter. It's incredibly draw worthy. Get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. I, th- I think the one good thing about um, Antonosity's Workshop is I can never find it on the web because I can never remember how to spell it. You can never spell it. <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, but- my, unfortunately, in Google, it's got to the point where as soon as I put in A N T E, uh, it it auto completes for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have that problem with a few sites that I wish I didn't. Ha- have a look, have a drill. Mm. You've got some very very nice vehicles on there. Sigh, sigh. That's me. That's me. Not a lot done this week. It sounds like we've all had a quiet week. What should we do next then? What should we do next then? Uh, yeah, okay. Let's um, let's get talk to someone. Talk to someone. Let's let, let's get Mark on the show, and we'll chat about Fantasy Sword and Spear, shall we? Big battle fantasy games. We hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you are, would you like to support us? There's a couple of ways of doing so. You can become a patron of the show by supporting us on our Patreon page. There, you can give regularly every time we produce a show. Alternatively, you may want to give a one-off donation, and you can do that by using PayPal. For more details on both these options, please click on the Donate tab on our website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. Have you ever wondered what's going on in wargaming? We do too. So come with us as we go behind the hobby with the Meeples and Miniatures interview. We'd like, a, like to welcome back to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast he, uh, for his, I think this is his third visit on the show. Uh, it's Mr. Mark Lewis. Hello, sir. Hi, Neil, and 
the rest of you. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to talking again. How are you doing? You alright? Yes, very good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good to catch up with you again. This is uh, a conversation we we promised to have for a while, and uh, it's just kind of, again, it's one of these things of getting everybody's ducks in a row, so uh, yeah, so we can get a chance to meet up. So a while ago, uh, we took we had Mark on, and we talked about sword and spear, and and then we had Mark and Stuart on, and we and we and we started talking about sword and spear fantasy as a thing, and. That came out at oh, was that launched the salute? It was, wasn't it? Yes, I think so. Yes, it was. Yes, yes, it was launched the yeah, salute. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's it's just taken this this long to get around to organising it to get Mark actually on the show to chat all about Sword and Spear fantasy because people who listen to the show know that Sword and Spear is uh, one of our favourite wall sets, and so having a fantasy version was something we were we were particularly excited about. Uh, and so it's good to have Mark on to to chat all about Fancy Sword and Spear, uh, and but we also happen to be graced with one of the playtesters for the game as well, don't we, Mister Hobbs? Possibly. I think I, I, th- I think I can say that now. <laughs> Are you allowed to say something about it now? Yes. Now it's been out for like you know three months. <laughs> I take um, confidentiality very seriously, Neil. Oh no, you do. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, apart from when it's stories about Neil, of course, then you spill your guts, don't you? Oh, oh god, yeah, yeah. Anybody who wants to have Mike as a playtester, it's like it's like trying to get blood out of a stone when he's actually when he's actually working on something. So, so no, he was re- he was really good and hard and hard and hardly said a word. Uh, yeah, he won't even tell us. No, even exactly. off air. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Even with the thumb screws on. Yeah. It is the, the bond of the of the play tester. It is a lonely life. <laughs> That's a surprising that Neil doesn't do it more. Yeah. He's too fighting. Ah right, I see, yeah. Anyway, uh Mr Lewis <laughs> Let's talk to our guest for a minute, shall we? Sword and Sphere Fantasy. Uh at what point did you decide to do a fantasy version of the rules? Well, it was something I was always going to do. Um, originally, when I started writing Sword and Spear, they were actually going to be fantasy set rules to begin with. I started working on them as a fantasy set rules sort of back a few years ago. And then I decided to just sort of cut out the fantasy elements and just release them as a historic set of rules. Yeah. So then it was a natural thing for me to sort of add back some of the fantasy elements uh, and then do it as an actual fantasy set afterwards. Um, so it's, it's sort of always going to happen, really, because I've always been interested in fantasy, and I've always sort of thought there's been a sort of gap in the market for a big battle, a fantasy set rules, that, that is really a, a proper big battle set. Yeah. Bar some of the sort of sets that are really, really uh, sort of all about some detail. There hasn't really been that many proper big battle sets that sort of top down, um, that really the sort of size of the battles you get in, in things like Lord of the Rings. Right. Well, I think first off, for, for, for those people who may not have come across Sword and Spear before, do you want to give us the um, the quick uh, overview of Sword and Spear itself uh, and how that game works? Yeah, very briefly then, well, as briefly as I can. Sword and Spear, it's, it's well, the, the ancient and medieval set. It's, for, it's a big battle set of rules for, for creating sort of battles, it's sort of 10,000 upwards per side, um, that kind of scale. It, it's unit based, so you can have, you have units of troops, and uh, it doesn't really matter how many figures on a unit base, but the units are all the same width. So everything is sort of one unit fighting another unit. There's no sort of counting figures or anything like that. And you typically have about 12 to 16 of these units aside so you'll have unit heavy foot and cavalry and light foot and the elephants in, in these sort of historic game the main sort of uh unique thing about sword and spear is the activation of units where dice are put in a bag one dice per unit on each side um, a different color for each side and throughout phases of the game these dice are pulled out seven dice at a time and pulled out and bold and then allocated to units and you need a certain number or higher to activate a unit 
So an average unit needs a four or higher to activate. But if it wants to do anything particularly um, difficult, it needs a higher dice. Better quality units will need a three or higher. And if the unit's got a commander with it, it makes it a little bit easier as well. It reduces its number by one that it needs to activate it. So the the sort of the interesting and, and challenging part of the game comes in in activating these dice. You have to sort of prior manage what you've got and prioritize what you want to do to fulfill your plan. And it means there's often sort of focused on one area of the battlefield at a time. And then maybe it's shifts in initiative changes as one player gets more dice, he allocates those first. And then the other player has to react to that, might also sort of do something unexpected somewhere else on the battlefield as well to try and sort of shift the initiative and focus. So all the time there's this sort of interesting sort of thing about what you do with these dice and how you use them. Do you sort of charge with one unit? Because you can also give di bonuses with these dice as well. So do you, do you put a few dice in one unit to charge or do you try and get your whole battle line moving together using more of your dice? And try and sort of play things out more slowly or you sort of take chances in certain places focusing on certain areas and that gives the game its sort of challenge and, and interest most people that, that have played it that's that's the sort of the the interesting thing this sort of the allocation of the dice the activation dice the the rest of it i've sort of tried to keep relatively simple um the combat mechanisms um the combat and shooting mechanisms are the same there's no sort of dice roll modifiers no big table of modifiers um, that you add to dice so each side rolls a certain number of dice um, the number of dice can change according to the situation but it's normally only by one or two dice depending on the situation uh, like flank attacks and uphill that kind of thing you get an extra dice um, and then each side rolls their dice in combat or shooting lines them up against the opposing dice and higher dice rolls cause a discipline test. Low, if you double the opponent's dice, it's, it's a hit and units take a certain number of hits until they are routed. But even with the routes, I've tried to keep it simple. With If a unit routes, it's just removed immediately. There's none of the sort of um, keeping the units on the table and, and moving them each turn and, and, and complex pursuits or anything like that. So most of it I've tried to keep relatively simple so that the focus is on this command and control and the allocation of, of the activation dice and what you do with those um, to really focus on that sort of uh, the, the, the interesting side of the command and control decisions. Great, thanks for that. So obviously Sword and Spear has been through a, a couple of editions now and, the, and it's currently being uh, distributed through Great Escape Games. And obviously, obviously, you yourself have been supporting it with a, a whole load of online uh, army lists uh, and what have you. So there's a whole ton of stuff available for Sword and Spear. You said that when you originally devised Sword and Spear, it was always going to be it was originally going to be a fantasy game, and then you and then you ended up taking stuff out uh, to produce the historical version. So having removed particular elements of the rules. Uh, had you found, uh, did you then f uh, find particular challenges in reintroducing them? Had kind of some of your thinking and ideas changed in the meantime? Yeah, I mean, because obviously from when they, from the, the original sort of first drafts really looked nothing like Sword and Spear ended up anyway. Um, there was lots of different activation mechanisms I tried. So what I sort of took out really when it went back in was going to be always going to be completely different. So the sort of the main challenges challenges of going to the fantasy rules were sort of adding in the fantasy elements, the big fantasy elements really, well, the big one being magic, but also a few new troop types as well. And, and then things like flight and dead as well. So adding those in without sort of overcomplicating the game, keeping to the sort of same sort of philosophy that, that I'd approached with the rules in the first place, sort of keeping things simple and keeping the focus on those command decisions. I didn't want sort of any one element like magic or heroes or particular troop types to to sort of be overpowered and overwhelm the game. So really keeping it as still as a sort of big battle game between units of infantry and cavalry with some sort of support from the magic and some of these sort of more exotic troop types, but still really about a big battle between units of infantry and cavalry, but obviously not necessarily human now in the fantasy rules, but really getting it, getting it sort of to look like what you would expect from 
a Lord of the Rings or from a Conan battle or something like that, from battles from literature and film, um, and, and trying to sort of keep it in line with what you would expect from this type of, those type of battles. I suppose that yeah, the, the $64,000 question is, how did you go about that? Uh, yeah, and what particular challenges were involved? Well, as with any sort of design, it's, it's trying things out and playtesting them. A lot of things I sort of tried out myself and, and maybe just sort of put a few figures on the table and try with a few units. Well, sometimes it's just kind of getting things down on paper and then thinking through them and you, you think, oh, that's not going to work. But sort of trying these different iterations of, of, of things and then putting it out to playtesters. I mean, as an example with the magic, I, I was sort of trying the normal sort of way most fancy do, rules do magic is have these sort of lists of spells and you might have to sort of spend magic points to cast spells or pick particular spells before the game that mm-hmm. your magic users can cast. Uh, and I did sort of try out some of those type of ideas. Um, but really, most magic in, in sort of battle games boils down to a few main effects, and that is the sort of having an effect on the enemy, like attacking the enemy, or having some sort of supporting effect on your own units, making your own units stronger. And whether that's through sort of making them roll more dice in, in combat or, or making their armor better or, or making them harder to hit or just doing all these different things, it all really amounts to the same kind of thing. And um, basically it's making them better in fighting. Um, so rather than having sort of different spells that might affect their armor or affect their strength or affect their speed of attacks, I've just sort of boiled that all down to a few basic spell effects. One, one spell effect can boost your own units, one can attack the enemy, one can protect your own units from missiles, and uh, the other one can uh, rally or heal your own units. I mean, it does mean there isn't that sort of effect of um, you can't have spells that say affect terrain or cause a, a wall of fire to be fought between your own units and the enemy, which you might get with spell lists. By boiling it down to those sort of few simple effects, it makes the game a lot easier to play. If you've played the historic game, you can pick up and play the fantasy game pretty much straight away. And if you haven't played for six months, you can come back to it and you don't have to then think, oh, what spells do I want my magic user to have for this game? You can just sort of get straight into it and play um, because it is just sort of the spells are just boiled down to these few effects. You don't need to think about them before the game. Your magic users get spell points and you can do any of those spell effects with those spell points. There are different strengths of magic user um, and you can sort of then have a more powerful effect, but it still all boils down to those four basic types of spell, attack, protect, um, boost your own unit, or, or, or rally or heal your own units. And you can imagine if you're attacking the enemy, you can imagine your magic is casting fireball or a lightning bolt or whatever that sort of, whatever you want that effect to be, sort of to imagine that effect to be, but it doesn't make any difference in game terms, it's just a magical attack. Um, so that, that was sort of one of these things I tried out a few different ways of doing it, but in the end I wanted to keep it simple and in line with, with the rest of the game in terms of the combat system, not adding anything complicated to the combat system. So the magical attack works exactly the same way as a normal attack. And if you boost a unit, it works exactly the same way as if you um, boost that unit by giving it a, a, an action dice showing a six, which, which gives it an extra combat die so it can move an extra distance unit. Um, so just sort of keeping it very simple and in line with the overall design philosophy of the game. So it went through a few iterations, but I, I sort of quickly realized that, that that's the way I wanted it to work. And then it was just experimenting with exactly how many magic points the magic users should get and, and how, how many magic users, how many points it spend depending on the range of the attack and that kind of thing. And just sort of trying to get it all balanced. Sometimes we, we tried games where the magic users are too powerful and they were sort of doing too much on their own. So some of that was sort of changed with, with the amount of magic points they get or the, or the range cost to do these spell effects. So they couldn't be doing too much and, and overpowering the game. Another one, another area of design area that went through a few sort of changes and a lot of playtesting. Probably the most playtested area was the rules for undead. Uh, and, and again, I wanted, I wanted it to be in line with the overall philosophy of the game but I did want undead to feel different. I wanted commanding an undead army for it to feel different. And, and, and there was some sort of things where you didn't activate them in the same way as the normal units at all. And we tried that out. Uh, and although it's sort of good and it did feel very different, 
in some ways that that kind of felt a bit too different and then I, I brought it back to more like a normal activation um, but that, that also you can use magic points to effectively make it a little bit easier to activate your undead units as well as the magic the the necromancers who are the, the effectively the generals of the undead army as well as them being able to cast those normal spells they can also use their magic points to influence the action dice and make it easier to activate your units the 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 the, the, the balance or the the other side to that is that undead units are always sort of disciplined for or activation so you don't uh, you don't get those sort of elite units that, that you can activate ease more easily with the threes and when you put command with them with the twos like you get in a normal army so undead are on the whole harder to activate but they can use magic points to make them easier to activate so you really with an undead army you need these necromancers to command them and they need to be using their magic command the undead army to, to actually activate the units so it does feel differently and they fight differently as well they don't take discipline tests so they fight differently in terms of the, the combat results are slightly different for undead units and so there's another sort of area that needed a lot of play testing to get the balance right to get undead feeling different but not to make it so different that that you could come back to it after a few months of not playing and then have to sort of read the rules and learn how to do it again and that was just sort of again what I want was one thing I was aiming for with design. When it comes down to like the undead rules in the book, where I mean, you're looking at what it's 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 a page, isn't it? So the, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's one or two. Is it one or two pages? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's they they will feel different and they fight different. But yes, it is only one page of rules for undead. So yeah, if you're coming if you're if you're coming to the game and you, even if you'd only played the historic game. And you're going to command an undead army. You could just read that one page of rules, and, you, and you'd know the differences there. Yeah, um, and, and I've tried to sort of keep it like that generally. If, if if you've got a few different unit types in your army um, that aren't in the normal historic game, you can just sort of look at the rules for those unit types and see how they're going to be different, and then and then just sort of get into it quite quickly. So, just out of curiosity on the undead, there's a, quite a lot of uh, what's the word I'm looking for here. Between different fantasy settings, there's all lots of different subtle shades of, of different ways undead behave. And I, I guess for, for your normal activation mechanisms, you can reflect most of those with. Is, is it similar with undead if you want sort of, you know, different levels, dif- different behavior between zombies and skeletons and that kind of thing? Is that relatively easy to do? Well, the, not really, in, in, in that all undead are treated as discipline four for activation, and you can effectively use the magic points to to activate them more easily now you can you can reflect the different reflect those through the troop types and, and through the sort of the the um the, yeah the troop types and the armor and the weapons any special rules they have but in terms of activation all the un, i've just assumed that they're all the same um so yeah the, the any undead are the same to activate there's no sort of different qualities of, of undead. Um, I think they, they are sort of mindless creatures activated by the magic users. So you can't get sort of elite undead or, or, or poor quality undead. They're all the same to activate. It's just struck me, actually, going back to what you were saying very early on about Lord of the Rings, you could do uh, the horns, the, the sort of mindless trees that the Ents summon to fight as undead, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, and I suspect that would work quite well, wouldn't it? Yeah, it well do. Yeah, yeah. If you were doing a battle with a lot of them, so that it was, yeah, yeah, they would really seem to be treated differently. Well, when 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 they turn up, I seem to recall they do turn up by the horde. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. You've got, you've got me all thoughtful about doing a Lord of the Rings, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Which in- interestingly leads on to uh, uh, the question I was about to ask, which is okay. So it's fantasy so when most people produce a fantasy set of rules uh, they have a particular world in mind uh, and particular armies in mind you, you know so, so they will design a set of rules and and say right okay these kind of fit into this fantasy world is it like that with sword and spear no not at all no um the idea is that they can fit it into any sort of fantasy world 
as far as I could do that, really. Obviously, there's going to be some there's going to be some people saying, oh, oh well, I want to represent this particular thing, and sometimes it's going to be the case that you can't represent it without some sort of house rules or rules changes. But then that that should be relatively easy to do anyway. The idea was it is a generic set of rules, so that. But really, my, my sort of the aim is to get it to sort of work for things like Lord of the Rings and things like Conan. So when you read about the battles in a Conan book, the battles are pretty much like historical battle, but with maybe a bit of magic. Lord of the Rings, they're, they're like they're, they're like sort of historical armies, but plus there might be some trolls or some large elephants and, and possibly a little bit of magic as well, but but not sort of explicitly stated too much with the magic um but so it, it's it's trying to get those sort of battles from from literature and, and film um but for any world um, yeah so uh, you, you you can you can make up your own army lists um you can borrow army lists from other games if you want or just sort of use just do a generic battle it isn't intended to be in any particular world between orcs and humans or lizard men whatever you want uh, using armies from, from other games or just sort of general like 15 mil fantasy armies which is most of what I've got well I've got about 15 mil and 28 mil um, uh, but yeah it's meant to be a generic set of rules that you can do with as you want really okay. right so in that case then how when you come to this game and you want to put a couple of fantasy armies together how would you go about it well, it's it's up to the players how they want how they perceive those troops. There's some notes in the book um, in one of the appendices. There's, there's sort of guidelines as to what makes up the, tip, the troop types in the book. So you sort of what what would be heavy foot or what would be medium foot or, or light horse or beasts. Um, so there are guidelines there. So if you want a unit of bears, then that's going to be beasts. Um, if you've got a unit of eagles, it's probably going to be beasts with the flight ability. Mm -hmm. So there are guidelines in the book. There's typical, there's some sort of typical troop types. I've put some army lists online as well, which again you can go to so if you just want a sort of generic human, which you, use, you sort of fantasy human army is normally a sort of medieval human army. So there's one of those in the army lists. But I've also sort of put some eastern and some what I've called northern barbarians. So this could be sort of Viking type fantasy army with possibly wolf riders and valkyries and, and a few of those sort of extra things but but so there, there was guidelines out there uh, and if anyone was sort of once isn't sure they can always ask on the forum as well but really it's up to the up to the player how they how they perceive those units if you want your orcs to be heavy foot fine if you want your orcs to be medium foot with the impact characteristic because they're sort of looser organized and doing a wild charge that's fine as well. It's, it's up to the player how they perceive those troop types to operate and then classify them accordingly within the rules. Yeah, we haven't really discussed um, the characteristics because I, I, I think that's the the key for any sort of army creation. So there, there's these lists of of individual characteristics that you can give to your units and I think they're, they're the things that give things the flavour. So as you say, you know, you, you've got the impact one which you can give to a unit that you want to have a big effect when it rushes in, into combat. There's ones like fear and bravery, and you know some are, um, some units are expendable. So you know other, when they route, other units don't care about, about them. So it's it's this multi-layering of these characteristics and using them to fully describe you know what is essentially a unit of, of medium infantry or heavy infantry or cavalry. It's just that tweak around the corner. Oh, sorry, that, that tweak around that unit that really allows you to write your own story of what what sort of flavour of fantasy that you want to create. Yeah, that that's right. So you can you can have anything you like in your army as long as it it makes sense. I mean, the idea isn't to well, the the, the rules are aimed at sort of friend as a sort of friendly game where players want to use the armies they've got. So it isn't. It, the intention isn't for sort of people to think what their best possible troop type is and then make an army completely of that troop type. Um, but it's more like, well, I've got this lizard man army, so my lizard men are going to be heavy fur, and then I've got some dinosaur riders. They're going to be beasts with the savage capability, maybe, or impact as well. And then I've got my giant turtle riders. They're going to be large beasts with impact and armor. So it's really you, you put together those characteristics and 
and classify your troops as you think they would operate. Yeah, and there's a really nice um, PDF on, on the website which allows, it basically gives you the points. So, you know, you can build your armies and put some points behind them as well so you can, you know, build your, you know, build your army to a specific point level, if you will. Or you, uh, and it allows you to tweak things. And I, I had an amazing amount of fun during all the playtesting of just trying out different abilities and mixing and matching. Yeah, um, and, and, and the, the army list spreadsheets that you can download have got all of that in them as well. So you can just sort of with drop, drop down menus. You, you can just sort of, if you want to make up your own army list, you copy one of the ones I've got and then just change the troop types as you like and, and yeah, try different things and, and together in different ways. The other thing that we haven't sort of discussed is um, flying, because that's another big thing with fantasy. Yeah, and that that's one of the other sort of the main um uh yeah, the the main new things that had to go in. And it's a tricky one because some other rules um have sort of have more like hoppers than flyers where where they're flying but they're not treated as flying at the end of a turn. And I wanted flying creatures to actually feel like they are flying. Um with the sort of the the the, the vulnerabilities that, that would cause but also the in, in quite often um, they, if they're flying, they're, they're virtually they can be virtually immune to attack unless unless the enemy has got some sort of magical attacks or long range missile weapons to shoot them down. Mm. If you if you are flying high above the battlefield, you should be virtually immune. You might not be able to do very much while you are flying high, but you should be virtually immune to attacks from the enemy. So I wanted sort of flying creatures to be to be sort of realistic in that sense and 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 to, to feel like they would actually feel and also it means that the, that the you have to actually if you if your enemy's got flying creatures you have to be prepared for them because you have to think well they might come and land behind my lines and then turn and hit me in the rear so it means you need to keep a reserve or maybe have a, a magic user behind your lines ready to sort of shoot them down effectively it's your, it's your anti-aircraft uh, artillery that you keep back to to sort of deal with those flying creatures but but the, the difficulty is Obviously, our, our battle, our troops are on our battlefield in effectively in 2D. They're not. We we can't assume that you're going to have some way of sort of suspending them above the battlefield, even though that would be nice. Um, so the, the the way I sort of approached it is that flying creatures can either be flying low or flying high, and you need some sort of marker to indicate which. Um, and if they are flying high, they 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 can't. They can only sort of drop down one level, so they can't then attack some ground troops that turn because they'd only be able to drop down to flying low um, but while they are flying high it makes them a lot harder to um, hit with any missile weapons so that they do get that sort of relative immunity um, but the, the difficult thing with flying troops is if, if you want them sort of to be flying over over another unit on the table because obviously we have we have to put them on on the table um, so then there is a sort of trick difficulty of, of having to sort of either give them a bit of extra movement so that they clear the unit they're moving over or moving other units out of the way. So it's, it's a little bit fiddly any time you try and deal with that. Um, so the rules have to sort of account for what happens when you want to end a unit on top of another unit. Uh, so there are rules to account for that. Um, but generally, I wanted the rules to reflect the sort of the reality of what would the battlefield would be like as far as I sort of, uh, obviously there's kind of some, some guesswork and some, it, you have to sort of try and think to yourself how, what, what would happen, what would happen if there's an airship flying above the battlefield? How would, how would, um, how would a unit of flying eagles actually operate in a, in a, in a combat sort of situation? What would they do? How would they attack? And then trying to get that within the rules, but again, keeping the rules simple and not adding any, not adding too much in there really. Um, so again, I think it's only it's it's one page. I think yeah, it's, it's, again, it's one page of rules um, covering flying creatures, but they do add this extra sort of dimension to the game because, as I say, if you've got flying creatures on your side, even just one unit, that that can it's something else for the opponent to think about. You could fly behind their lines and attack a lone commander, or fly down and attack their camp, or fly and turn around and attack the units in the rear. So it really gives something extra to think about on both sides and how you use them and how you defend and counter those uh, flying units. Plus there's a fact that if you don't activate your flying units in in a turn, they have a habit of um, crashing. Yeah, yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
um, because of the activation system, it, something sort of ha I, said, I felt like something had to happen if you didn't activate them. So yeah, if they're flying high, uh, if they're flying low, they land, and if they're flying high, they land and possibly crash. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. So you do need to keep activating them when they are flying. Yeah. So, so basically, what what we're looking at is a an open set of fantasy rules where you can build your army very much dependent on how you think uh, an orc army or a dwarf army or an elf army would be, as opposed to you being prescriptive about, right, okay, this is an orc army, this is an elf army. Yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. I mean, that's always the approach I intended to take. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of rules do it the other way and have have the whole background, but but there's, there's there's obviously upsides and downsides to both. A lot of a lot of players I know do like the sort of prescriptive background, but that's more done when you're sort of tied in with a miniature line as well, uh, and some sort of pre-existing background, or you write your own. And obviously, it involves a lot more sort of work and sort of creative side in terms of coming up with 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 that background. And and the downside is that then you, you, you do sort of then tend to kind of be restricted to that one background. Um, so the intention was always for it to be a generic set of rules. Um, yeah, they, you get the converse disadvantage, of course, that, that people who aren't able or willing to invent their own settings can sort of flounder a bit with that kind of set of rule. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I've tried to give as much guidance as I can. But I mean, uh, my, my the, the fantasy gaming I've always done myself. I've never really been too, except when I've done things like Lord of the Rings. I've never been that fussed about the setting anyway. I'm happy to just put a couple of fantasy armies down and say, right, let's play orcs against men, um, without thinking it's from a particular setting. Um, yeah, true. Although, although I do do, I use this for Lord of the Rings as well. And then I am thinking, okay, well, we're doing the Battle of Five Armies or Helen or Fields or whatever. And then you are sort of trying to think about um, the the particular particular troop types from from the books or you know, there's, there's sort of plenty of scenarios online and things people of what they think should be at the battle of pelinor fields or battle of five armies and then using them for a particular setting like that and, and they, they do work well in those sort of settings but but most of the games i do are just yeah let's just play um let's just play goblins against elves or, or whatever armies they are but but if if your armies are, are from a particular uh, popular fantasy game, and you want to think of the, the think of it as being within that setting. That's fine. You can you can still um, you can use your armies from any 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 manufacturer or a mix of manufacturers, um, and, and you can apply it. You can you can you could even use army lists from if you've got particular armies from another game without mentioning any other of the popular fantasy war games. You could say, okay, well, let's try and let's convert these army lists into sword and spear army lists, and, and, and sort of consider it to be within that setting. You could do that as well. Game of Thrones, gentle listener. Yeah, well, that, that's another one. Yeah, that's yeah. Actually, that's, yeah. Again, with with sort of putting those battles from the books or the screen. And Game of Thrones is a good one because they are sort of quite realistic in terms of it's sort of pretty much based on our own sort of medieval history sort of wars of the roses or, or i know there's a bit of a mix of different sort of you've got the mongols haven't you with um the dothraki and and the iron islands are more like sort of vikings and then a lot of the uh westeros are more like sort of later medieval uh, uh, but they are sort of relatively realistic similar to historic battles obviously you've got dragons coming in now as well uh, and that's that so you can and, and magic in some of the battles as well, and that's all sort of yeah that 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 kind of thing is all very um, doable with these rules. Yeah. Now, the aforementioned uh, a lot of the aforementioned uh, war games rules that shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> you do tend to get a, a potential issue with um, a lot of popular uh, fantasy rule sets where the things that start to dominate the field are wizards. Heroes and monsters. Now you, you've been talking a lot about the fact that, well, actually, you know, sword and spear fantasy is a mass battle game. Yeah. So whilst those fantasy elements are important, uh, do they potentially dominate the field in the same way that they can do in other games? Um, no, I mean that that's something I wanted to avoid. 
and um, some of the, some a lot of the other fantasy games, even though they call themselves mass battle games, especially the sort of individually based twenty eight mil type games, they, they really you might they might have more figures on the table than you, you'd get in a game of sword and spear, but they're not representing a bigger battle because a lot of the these sort of rules are effectively written as if one figure is one man because you're sort of rolling a dice per figure uh, and the sort of the, the casualty removal and that kind of thing is effectively treating each figure as one man so a, in those sort of games a hero or a monster is going to be powerful because if a, if a hero is as good as 10 men if you've got a sort of like of conan and they're as good as 10 men well then they're going to take on a unit on their own and if you've got a, a, a giant he's, he's, he's going to take on a unit of 20 men on his own but in Sword and Spear, one unit of one unit, which might be represented by sort of anything between eight and twelve figures, say, um, or eight and sixteen figures, say, for a unit of heavy foot, that represents about a thousand men. So I, I had to make sure that things like heroes and giants and magic don't have that much of an effect. Now you need them to have some effect, otherwise, it's, it, people aren't to use heroes if a hero is only as good as 10 men then he's not going to have any effect on a unit of a thousand so i had to sort of effectively bump up their abilities a little bit compared to a whole unit um but not as much as to overpower it so um where units have strength a strength which is how many hits they can take and how many dice they roll in combat so a unit of heavy fast strength four most other units are strength three but a hero or a monster is only strength two so on their own, they're not going to have that big an impact. Now monsters are a bit different because they're a little bit harder to damage, and they uh, and units can't normally get any extra dice against them. But both heroes and monsters, they're they're more effective when they're actually used in combination with another unit. So if you've got a unit already fighting another unit and you put a hero in, then he is more likely to have an impact. But a hero isn't going to take on a unit of heavy foot on his own because that's like one man fighting against a unit thousand on his own and you, you can obviously that isn't really going to be uh, something you know, to happen um so they have their uses in the game heroes they're on smaller bases as well so they can sort of uh fit in in, in smaller gaps they can maneuver a lot more easily so they could sort of rush through the enemy lines in a gap and hit units on the flank or rear or try and take out an enemy hero or an enemy wizard magic user or the enemy general but they're not going to go killing units on their own and, and it, um, it's similar with monsters, um, although, um, again, I mean, a monster is supposed to represent a very large dragon or giant that, that would have some impact on his own. But still, if you put a, a hero on his, uh, a monster on his own against a unit of heavy foot, you're probably going to lose him. Again, put them in the flank of something that's already fighting. Fight against a unit of cavalry, more, more chance. But you have to be sort of careful about how you use these units, and that they're not going to over overpower the game. That um, they can, they can be quite brittle. They can be quite fun when they do have an effect. If you put a giant into the flank of a unit and it takes it out in one go, it can be quite fun. But but that isn't going to happen all the time. Um, so I have definitely uh, kept those sort of powers down. And similarly, magic. Magic has this sort of boosting effect. It makes you generally it's used to make your unit stronger. So with the magic, it's it's a sort of extra resource to manage effectively. If you've got two or three magic users, you're getting these magic points every turn that can boost your own units. Yes, you can do some magical attacks, but in order to do that, you've got to put your magic users with a line of sight to the enemy, which could be sort of putting them at risk themselves. So generally, you're using your magic users to boost your own units. So it's a sort of managing this extra resource and that adds a sort of extra layer to the game. Game, but again, without overpowering it, you're not going to suddenly sort of turn a unit of peasants into a uh, killing machine just because you've got a magic user nearby. So it's, it's, it sort of adds an extra um, bit of interest to the game and the, the other different troop types as well, but without overpowering it. Um, and it is, it will still feel like a big battle game where, where the units are large amounts of men and it's those units of, of men and units of your cavalry and, and, and those sort of normal units of battle line troops are going to win the game for you it's how well you use them that, that will that will really make the difference of whether you win or lose if people get the rules and uh, yeah they want to put a game together uh, what's the scenario support and the army list support and and, and uh, yeah what sort of stuff is available um well they so say the army there's, there's some sort of sample army lists online 
um, sort of spreadsheets you can download and then build up your own army lists. And there are some, I don't know, it's probably about eight. There's, there's the normal sort of types. I think there's four different human ones and then there's orcs and, and elves and dwarves. So there's your, your sort of standard fantasy army lists on there with with what with sort of my opinion really of the sort of typical treatments they would have and most of that is is geared around what i've got myself yeah. um so um the, the uh, and how i see that my most of my dwarfs i've got based as heavy foot because that's sort of, i mean it's your normal sort of view of dwarfs isn't it they're they they sort of uh, solid battle line heavy foot troops and they don't have a lot of cavalry they might have a unit of or some bears or something like that. Um, but generally, most of the dwarfs, yeah, you've got these sort of some artillery, dwarf crossbowmen, dwarf axemen, dwarf spearmen. Most of them are heavy foot. So there's there's the sort of typical, mainly based on a sort of standard fantasy sort of troop types in, in the army list. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I say, you can download those spreadsheets, change them as much as you want, put, it, put any new ones in there. Um, if people want any advice on how to deal with a particular troop type then you can post that on the forum and, I, and i'd sort of say what i thought but again it, it's it's up to you um so it but but the, 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 the advice will be there if anyone asks for it or if somebody sort of wants to know how to model a particular army from lord of the rings or game of thrones or anything like that then the best thing to do is, is sort of try it out put together an army list discuss it on the forum see what you think see what other people think in terms of scenarios, I mean, it's it's a big battle game. So most of the scenarios, most of the most of the battles are just going to be line up and fight because that is, and again, it's a bit different to probably a lot of army, other, other rules in that sense because lots of other rules have these sort of defend the quarter of the table or seize a particular objective. Um, but but in reality, in, in in sort of history, most ancient and medieval battles weren't like that. The, people weren't fighting to control a hill or to control a quarter of a table or, or seize a particular objective. Most battles were to destroy the opposing army. Um, so really, it's, it's mainly aimed at those kind of battles. Now, there are a few scenarios, having said that, there's a few scenarios in the book. So um, there are, um, there's um, sort of uh, ambush with crossing and sort of defending the hill, defending the high ground type scenarios. So you can sort of try out a few different things like that. And there's also suggestions in in the rule book about how to sort of create scenarios from historic scenarios. So you could uh, sort of use Agincourt as an example and and put together an Agincourt scenario with maybe sort of elves instead of the uh, uh, instead of the English and um, I don't know um, orcs. Although maybe it'd be a largely orcs. Well, a largely mounted orc force as the French putting so you can use sort of sources like that to gather scenarios or obviously fantasy literature as we've discussed Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Conan, any of these sort of books are a useful idea for putting together scenarios. But but I sort of do envisage that most games it, it will be get get a thousand points on each side and, and line them up and, and by a bit, uh, just a sort of clash of forces type battle. Yeah, I think it's it's worth sort of reiterating how much of a toolkit set of rules this is. I mean, this is a a brilliant set of rules that allows you to use your imagination and create the armies that you want. And you know, I during the playtesting, Mark, I I threw loads of stuff at this and tried tweaking things around and you know just looking at figure collections and trying to work out how I wanted this 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 model to to act and. The, the rules allowed me to do that. Yeah. And I think that's that's one of the great strengths of this. It's, it's not telling you what a, a, a set of figures is. It's allowing you to design your own fantasy. Yeah. And one difficulty coming from the historic rules is in the historic rules, the, the army lists are pretty much sort of, well, uh, they're based on history. So they're, um, it, obviously, we don't always know that much about particular historic armies. As far as we do know, the lists sort of restrict what you can have. So there's that sort of automatic balancing effect of no historic army just had elephants. So you can't have a historic army just with elephants. But in fantasy, you can do that if you particularly want to. Mm. So you could have an army just of large beasts or, or an army purely of heavy foot. So it, it's even more important that the sort of troop types are, are balanced and uh, the points were as sort of the, the kind of correct points to give a balanced game. Now, obviously, it's, it's impossible really to get points perfect. Um, but 
it's all most of the most of the troop types are based on what's already there in the historic rules which have been sort of out for a few years and played by a lot of people and we've had a lot of feedback on on the points so i'm i'm pretty confident that the points are reasonably sort of close to being a, a, as balanced as they can be so if people do want to try an army purely of sort of large beasts like an army of effectively like sort of elephants or an army purely of um I don't know, an army all of, of beasts or of, of lots of swarms in your army, it should all it should all work and, and give still give a reasonably balanced game. I'm um, gonna try that Ensign Horns army, <laughs> I swear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well yeah, I mean the the army events, um would, well you could just have an army events as well, just of large we call them large beasts and have that would be a sort of just a, a perfect example of that really. And and they are powerful troops, but they have their weaknesses and the points They burn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, so weakness to magic attacks, yeah. And and the points should reflect their strengths and weaknesses anyway. So hopefully, I mean, I haven't, I haven't sort of heard reports of any particular issues with the points. Um, but it, it was sort of in some ways more important to get it right with the fancy rules because they're, they're so sort of freeform in terms of, of the army selection. Uh, and and if, if there was anything sort of glaringly out in the points, if anything was sort of underpowered or overpowered or underclusted, then people would be just choosing armies and all of those uh, and then it would sort of cause an issue um, but the, the the reason the, the points aren't in the book and, and are kept online is that I do have that ability then to tweak any points if, if major issues come up um, like, like we did with the historic rules after a couple of years a couple of minor changes were made um, so I do sort of keep that um, control over them because they're not that, that's the sort of reason I didn't want points to be in the book and I've kept that online as a as a free download so it's, it's there and I, it means I can change it after a couple of years if lots of people are saying oh certain troop types are overpowered or nobody uses swarms because they're too expensive or something like that then I, I do have that uh, ability to then change the points yeah I mean the other thing we haven't mentioned is um, stratagems which are Again, uh, are things that you can add to your army, which you can use on the battlefield, so things like um, summoning. Yeah, so. again, it, again, it can give some of the armies a little bit of flavour. Just mm. having, um, yeah, some summoning can make your magic users um, keep a few troops back and, and summon them at certain places on the battlefield. And then there's others like woodsmen, which would be appropriate for an army of wood elves, which gives troops a sort of slight advantage in different terrain. And then there's one that, that gives you a sort of magical artifact that can strengthen your magic users. There's, there's the same ones that are in the historic games as well, like um, uh, flank march and, and, and ambushes. Um, there's one for dangerous terrain, so you can have, you could sort of uh, say, oh, this piece of terrain's got uh, quicksand, or, or there's, a, there's a, a, li a lion fried in, in that sort of. Uh, over there or a bear cave on that hill and that makes it a dangerous piece of dangerous terrain and again there's, there's not there's not different rules for different types of whatever you want to call it it's the same effect the dangerous terrain means that you're potentially going to get damaged if you, your unit ends in that terrain um, but you could model that as a as an area of quicksand or you could model it as a as a bear in a cave on, on the hill and it, again it just adds a sort of bit, a bit of flavor and a bit of interest another one is the augury where you get a few re-rolls um, through sort of uh, divine intervention um, and, and you can that's another stratagem you can have to give you a few sort of uh, give you a few re-rolls during the game so yeah they all they, they all just sort of add, add a little bit of flavor a little bit of ways to sort of tweak your army and, and make things a little bit um, different and, and more interesting yeah so it, it, it's all in there folks yeah, I've tried to, to sort of get, it's difficult, that, that, that's one of the difficult things, um, because my, my sort of fantasy background is, is kind of literature and things like that, but I haven't played some of these other popular fantasy games, and what, what, what I want to be able to do is, is sort of cover everything that is in those games, not, not the detail of everything, because that's never going to happen, I'm not going to be able to sort of recreate every single individual monster type. Um, but by being quite generic and having these sort of broad troop types, trying to be able to cover um, most of what people would want and, and give people the ability to reflect how they want their troops to act within the sort of the, the, 
the troop types and, and classifications of the rules. And, and hopefully I'll, I've sort of done that to as much as an, an extent as it is possible. There's always going to be some things, especially with the magic, there's going to be some people that would want more detail in the magic and want these sort of spell lists and the magic users to be able to do lots of more different things and have more of an impact on the battlefield. Um, but again, in keeping with the sort of size of the battles that we're, we're portraying here, I wanted the magic to be more of a sort of booster unit, this sort of resource that you have to, to manage. I've tried to get everything as far as I'm aware is needed, like flight and undead and magic and the different troop types. I've tried to sort of add everything in that I feel um, is necessary for this sort of big battle fantasy game. Yeah, and I I think it's in there. You know, I I played an awful lot of this, and and tried very hard to break it. Um, uh, we we weren't able to. Um, right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, as I say, the advantage is when you've got a really decent core set of rules. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know, putting the um, say putting the uh, the the fantasy flavour over. Uh, yeah, the fantasy flavour over the top of them. It's it's good to have that there. But yeah, as I say. It's a really sound core set of rules, so uh, it's good. Yeah, and I was, always, I was always building on the basics without trying. The, the main sort of aim was not to make anything too overpowered, so mm. that, that things will be interesting. You'll want to use magic users. You'll want to try out flying creatures and things, but they're not going to dominate the game. Um, they give a bit of extra tactical sort of challenge and interest to the game, um, whether you've got them or whether you're facing them. But they're, but they're they're not generally going to dominate, and they're not going to be the, the sort of, they're not they're not going to win the battle on their own, um, and that that was always the aim. So I was sort of always trying to keep things sort of uh, underplayed, really, rather than sort of having too much of an impact. Cool. So as far as Sword and Spear Fantasy is concerned, how can people get hold of it? Because obviously, originally, your, the first edition Sword and Spear Historical uh, was available as a, um, a, a hard copy or a PDF. Uh, when it comes down to Sword and Spear Fantasy, um, how can people get hold of it? Um, well, it, you can buy it through Great Escape Games, so mail order or at sh well, generally at shows as well where they've got a presence. It should also be available in um, in shops and through in other countries through through online retailers in other countries as well. Um, but certainly in the UK, the best place is just to go direct to Great Escape Games, and it's fifteen pound uh, plus postage. Uh, yeah. It's quite reasonable. Oh yeah, very much so, very much so. And obviously, if people want uh, want all the uh, the online support and all the army lists and advice, where do they need to go to? That's well, through either through my website or through through the forum. Now, the website is um, well. The best thing to do is is to Google Paul Kovnik Productions. It's it's paulkovnik.moonfruit.com is the website and the the. I'm trying to look in the rule book myself now because I don't know the actual web address for the uh, for the forums. But the uh, yeah, the forums is polkovnikproductions.freeforums.org. Generally, if you Google well, if you Google Sword and Spear or Google Great Escape Games or Polkovnik Productions or all of those at once, you will find links to the the website and the forum. Uh, and obviously, on the website, there's a link to the forum as well. As I have just done. I can promise you, gentle listener, it's dead easy. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's, it should be the first thing that comes up, really. If you Google, if you Google Sword and Spear War Games, you'll see all the Worst case, you have to figure out how to spell Polkovnik, which is exactly yeah, that, as it sounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you can just go for Sword and Spear as well. Yeah. Cool. Sword and Spear Fantasy, I, I mean, as far as the rules are concerned, they've, a, they've actually kind of been finished for a while, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, what have you been up to since? Um, well, unfortunately, not, not that much gaming recently. Um, my gaming's been sort of curtailed a bit recently through jobs and, and other sort of circumstances with driving children around and, and uh, these things that, that we have to do when our children get to a certain age. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, I mean, in terms of rules writing I've, I've got some on the go that, that i haven't really done much on recently but my next sort of project is, is the intention is to 
get started again with this soon and may, maybe it'll happen at some point over the summer and that's a um skirm a sort of relatively large skirmish set of rules up sort of 50 to 100 figures aside fantasy ancient and medieval skirmishes because that's something i think there's a bit of a gap in the market for, yeah, for skirmishes of that sort of size i mean obviously the saga for the sort of dark ages and that's an excellent game um but that is relatively sort of restricted in that you can only fight battle with armies where there's a battle board available and i know you can sort of write your own or do a bit of tweaking of the ones that come in there to sort of make them fit what you've got um but generally that that's sort of aimed at, at those kind of quite specific dark ages and crusades periods and there's not really a lot else of that sort of size the sort of 50 to 100 figures there's some smaller scale skirmishes but yeah because there's, there's partly because there's a gap in the market but also it's something i like doing myself that sort of size battle yeah so that's something i have been working on and again i've t- tried out a few sort of different activation systems some that are sort of a little bit similar to sword and spear um so the focus is still going to be on that sort of command and control but all, all trying to get it sort of feeling like a sort of a warband size battle um with with sort of units um uh, sort of units of sort of 10 to 20 figures and, and maybe sort of three four five or six of those units on a side um but also with with the sort of individual characters as well probably some more detailed magic but the, again it would probably be that i would do it as a historic game first and add in some sort of um magic even though i'm currently sort of working on it as a as a fantasy set of rules um but but yeah something that you can sort of again do you sort of lord of the rings battles with uh, and uh, but it was also just as suitable for sort of medieval and and um viking and, and ancient skirmishes because a, a lot a lot of forums there's often people asking for for those sort of size battles and again there's, there's not many um rules for that side people people might suggest the lord of the rings um, strategy battle game as as a sort of set of rules for medieval battles or for, or for for viking battles if you don't want to use saga because there isn't really much out there for that size um so that that is something that um say so yeah, I've, I've been working on it i've got a set of rules in development I just haven't done much recently um the same my, my rules writing's been quite curtailed um because of my sort of job i've started a new job this year and it's, it's taken a lot more of my time than than i was uh than, than last year so i used to get especially around this time of year uh, i used to get a lot of my uh uh being I'm, I'm a teacher so around this time of year when sort of kids have done exams and things you get quite a lot of a lot more free time a lot yeah. less marking and things in the evenings and previously that's when i sort of done most of my rules development but having started a new job this year it hasn't really been the case so much See, I haven't really had as much time to work on on things. But hopefully, I will get more time over the next year or so to do that and start sort of getting stuck into that. Um, cool. But yeah, been, even playing wise, I haven't haven't been doing that much. I've had I've had the odd game of sword and spear, um, a few other a few other things here and there as well. But but even my sort of normally I'd sort of play at least once a week, and that hasn't been happening so much. We've just sort of uh, a few different commitments with with children and football and ferrying them around and things is uh just haven't really been getting as much playing time as i would like recently mm, indeed yes i think we've all been there yeah. <laughs> in our time yeah. yeah well mark thanks for coming on the show and chatting to us about sword and spear fantasy uh, I, I mean, yeah, so it's been out for a while. I, I mean, yeah, how's it been? Yeah, how's it all been going? Has it been? Um, uh, um, has it been fairly active on the forums and lots um, of interest? Not, not that much on the forums recently. No, um, I mean, I haven't been as 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 I haven't done as much as I'd like in terms of battle reports. So I was actually trying to put a battle report on a couple of weeks ago and having a lot of trouble getting photos onto the normal normal uh, photo sort of source that I use, and then I've been struggling to get that done but i do need to get back on to doing that i've had no problems in the past and suddenly i can't download or upload any photos so i've got loads of photos to put on the report um i mean i don't know about sales because it's obviously because it's through great escape games i don't really sort of see the the detail there um mm. but i mean people are certainly playing people are, are still playing sword and spear historic uh, and one thing that sort of happens i think sometimes with the forums is 
people are playing and happily playing and you don't hear about it unless there's a question yeah. um so some, it's very hard to sort of gauge the sort of level of of, of interest or play um it's nice to see some pictures of sword and spear games in in miniature war games last week just in a completely article that wasn't anything to do with sword and spear but the, the games that were being played with sword and spear so that, that was quite nice to see but yeah it's a, it's very hard to sort of gauge the level of um take up with, with a game like this with um so I don't really know at the moment. One thing I didn't mention actually earlier is that I've, put, I've started doing some how to play videos on YouTube. Uh, oh yes, I noticed it. that. Yes. Yeah, you, you put them on your um, on your blog, didn't you? They, yeah. they they sort of stalled a bit. Um, I did about five and, and some a few months ago, and and they kind of stalled. And I do need to get back to those. Hopefully, with the uh, school summer holidays starting next week, I'll get to finish them off. I think I'll need to. Uh, I, might, I, I might I might need to pay my photo, my photographer, my cam my camera woman, which is my uh, my nine year old daughter, was doing the camera work, and I think she got a bit bored after doing those five. So I might have to give her some incentive to carry on and do them and, and also hold the camera a bit more steady because there was some comments about camera shake um but i do that's something i will need to do as well and, and hopefully that will sort of uh, uh, help with the sort of interest in the game as well cool well once again thank you very much for uh, for coming on thank you thank you for sword and spear it is one of our it is one of our all-time favorites and uh, yeah we do yeah we love it to death so yep. thank you yeah really enjoy it thank you ever so much and yeah, th uh, thanks for having me again it's it's uh once again it's a pleasure to come on here and, and chat about war games yeah cool and so all the very best for the future uh and we we look forward to hearing more about this uh more about this new skirmish game development when it's a little bit more along the line yeah hopefully it'll probably be about five years from now but <laughs> at, 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 at this way anyway um, yeah except except for hob obviously you'll hear about it in two weeks time and not be allowed to talk to it for four years <laughs> Yeah, hope hopefully I will. Uh, I'll, I'll get stuck into that and have something to report in in a year or two. Oh, that's cool. Well, yeah, as I say, thanks very much, Mark. All the best, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, thanks a lot. Nice to chat to you all again. Okay, goodbye. Well, that was nice to hear back from Mark. We must get him back to do those um, board game reviews for us. I've been so nice and not pointing that out for the last heaven knows how long. I know, you, I know you've been You going. had a go there. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Sorry, Mark. It was Neil's fault. <laughs> no, let's blame Dave. It's Dave's fault. Yeah. D Dave said he didn't want you on, Mark. I, I couldn't understand him myself. But uh, he was adamant. It was all Dave's fault because he's not here. Although, to be fair, it does sound like Mark's been a bit busy. Mark has been a bit busy, yeah. yeah. yeah in a good way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it does sound like, it, you know, we've probably spared him the anguish of having to turn us down. That true. is true, yeah. Yeah. But you had to go there, didn't you? Thank you for that. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. So there you have it. Sword and Spear, Sword and Spear Fantasy. Mass battle fantasy as opposed to super large skirmish or, uh, yes, intermediate. That's a good game. I was going to say, sword and spear, fantasy, what's not to like? Yeah, you have mm. dragons in there. <laughs> Job, jobs are good and pretty much, isn't it? Indeed. Mm. Indeed, cool. So is that about it, chaps? Is there anything else to chat about, or are we about done? I think we're about done. Unless, I think we're um... pretty much done. I'm still trying to unclog me glue. <laughs> <sighs> Right, well, any further suggestions to, 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 to for Mr. Whittaker to unclog his glue? Because he's not got a guitar string stuck in there. <laughs> Surely. <yeah. laughs> no, the guitar strings are out in the workshop and I haven't had time to nip out since we had that conversation. That would be funny if you were trying to unclog some super glue and then got that stuck in. <laughs> that would be, yeah, throw it away and start again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I have a bottle of glue, super glue stuck on the end of a guitar string. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, answers on a postcard to what you can do to convert something. Into... Right, okay, so so short of buying new glue. Yes, any suggestions Yeah, for anybody well, who's... Like, by the time this podcast actually goes out, I will either have fixed it or bought new glue. 
Well, yes, it's I'm, good for I'm, next time. I'm sure. I'm sure we can record uh, and 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 give out potential suggestions for how Mike can unclog his uh, uh, unclog his glue for next time round. So, if ha- anybody else happens to be in the same unfortunate position, they know Never. exactly what to do. Never let it be said that this show is not educational. It's a very specific um, education that you'll get from us. Uh, indeed. Yes, specialist. Special, yes. Very specialist. <laughs> yes, and on that note, I think it's time to say goodbye. All we've actually said is uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you uh, to uh, our resident troubadour. That'll That's be me mind. then. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah. You normally go on a bit more than that. I was waiting for the usual bout of uh, what's the words? Oh yes, over egging the pudding. Pudding? You never, you never said you had pudding. <laughs> ah, well, there you go. <laughs> oh, he's been holding out on us all this time. Mm-hmm. Oh. And don't forget that Mike's pudding recipe will be on the website. No, it won't. Got to have some secrets. Uh, He'll <clears> take <throat> his pudding secrets to the grave. Thank you once again to uh, to the Welsh Wizard. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye, Meeps. We will meet again soon. Indeed. And uh, finally, thank you one and all for listening. And continue to brought with this, um, yes. Banter? Banter. <laughs> <Yeah>. Drivel? <laughs> yeah, drivel. Yeah. That's a much better word. Drivel, yeah. yes. Delete is appropriate. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you for uh, joining us once again uh, for another week of Wargaming Banter. And tune in this time next week, and uh, we'll catch up with you again where we will be chatting to Adrian McWalter, who we only recently caught up with. Well, March. About two hours ago, wasn't it? <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Yes. Uh, you're, yeah. doing that, you're doing that whole spoil the illusion thing again. Oh, oh yeah. The timey wimey thingy. Timey, yeah, we will be timey wimey. Yeah, we have, well, we haven't really spoken to him two hours ago before we were recording this, but there we go. So next week we will be chatting to Adrian McWalter, uh, author of Over the Hills, about his new Napoleonic set of rules, which will be available for pre-order via a Kickstarter imminently. Watch this space. Until next time. Roll good dice. Take care. Happy gaming. We'll chat to you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with others by leaving us a review on iTunes. And if you have any comments or questions, you can always email the show. The address is info at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk And you can also visit our webpage where you'll find a complete episode archive, all the View from the Veranda podcasts, rules reviews, and our blog of hobby items and news, which is updated several times a week. This is also where you'll find the links to our presence on social media. And here you can follow us on Twitter or join our Facebook group. And finally, here you can also find details should you wish to support us by making a donation to the podcast. All this on the Meeples and Miniatures website, www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.